God's house. We gave it to Him. He gave it to us, and we gave it back to Him. We are actually the temple of the Holy Spirit, as you know. And so today, Father, we come to you as temples. your Holy Spirit will do the work in each vessel. That every individual will leave here touch, change, transform. Teach us the Lord by your Holy Spirit. We praise you for it. We praise you now for the cross. Would you just remain standing and let's just worship the Lord together. We praise you. I want you to put everything out of your mind from today to tomorrow. Let's give this time completely and exclusively to our Savior. Amen.
share with our sister here when we're talking. You know, this has been an unsettling time, I think, for a lot of people, uh, what's going on in the world events. But, you know, I, I just feel like we're getting ready to talk about the name of Jesus Christ. And I feel like that we've kind of gotten lost a little bit here recently in all the names that we're lifting up. You know, and I feel like, you know, there's, there's good, good, good men and good women in this world that we want to give honor to and we want to lift up. But, but there's one name that we're to be lifting up. And I feel like God is calling us, kind of calling us, He's like calling us back to the center, so to speak. You know, He's calling us back to the focus. You know, and it, it's time for us to get focused. And it's time for us to lift up the one and only name, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's what He's calling us to do, to lift up Jesus Christ. Because that is the only name that when we lift it up, that hearts of men and women and teenagers and boys and girls, they'll be drawn to that name of Jesus Christ. But not only will they be drawn to it, but they'll be transformed by that name. So let's lift up His name tonight, the name of Jesus.
offering in this time is worship. Give us an ear to hear what you're saying. Lord, help us to hear you with clarity. The church said amen. sermon that the Lord, the message that the Lord put in all of us 
about how we pray for our children and how we pray for those that are in need. And I, I'm here to declare to you that strongholds are coming down. Yes, yes. Strongholds are coming down. Say that with me. Strongholds are coming down. A stronghold is no small thing. It's complicated. It's demonic. It's like a large building with many floors and many rooms. But I'm here to tell you the dunamis power of the Holy Ghost has been given to us. And he said to the pulling down of strongholds. And we're going to continue to talk about that, the Lord willing, on Sunday. But tonight I want to talk about expectations. What happens when we live in expectation? And I would ask you to ask yourself the question tonight. When I get up in the morning, what do I expect? I'm going to tell you the hard truth for some of us to realize tonight is that when we get up in the morning, we don't expect very much. Many people have put their lives in neutral and said whatever will be, will be. But no, this is the time that God has called us to be intentional. This is the time that God has said, I want you to get up every morning with an attitude of expectation, expecting God to do great things. Some people just don't expect much. They've accumulated enough of life's disappointments to become afraid to dream. Right. They're afraid to reach out. They're afraid to stretch. They're afraid to broaden their horizons. Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 20, this is what he said. I live in eager expectation and hope. As I was praying that several days leading up to this service, I wanted to preach on hope. And the Lord began to show me that's what you're preaching on. That's what I'm talking about. We need to get up every morning with the same expectation that Paul had where he said, I have an eager expectation. I have a hope. If there was ever a guy who could be excused for not leave, live, living in expectation, it could have been Paul. All the beatings and the misgivings and the misunderstandings and the Punishment and the, what is the word I'm looking for? Suffering. He was suffered. And he was persecuted. Yes. And in his persecution, he said, I am eager. And I'm expecting, let's look at this. He, he, was, in, he was in a prison cell and he was expecting something great from God. What happens when I live with the power of expectation? Well, the first thing that's going to happen, one thing that's going to happen, I believe, is that we're going to rise above the norm. Right. The body of Christ in these last days, the church must be above norm. Yes, sir. They must, and we must be in the pursuit of excellence. When we take steps that will look and in just, uh, just a minute, then you and I will be one of a very small percentage of people on this planet. We will be focused not just on who we are, but on who we can become in Christ. We will be focused on the fact that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I want you to turn to somebody and say it's not over. It's not over. I'm very concerned. I'm, I am very concerned about a church that has given up expectation with the political events of these days. It's not over. God is still on the throne. The work of Jesus Christ continues. The Holy Spirit is still real. And he said in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Miracles are still taking place. Great things. And we have got to become people of expectation. If you and I will expect daily, then we will rise above the norm. And our outlook on life will change. And 
we will stand out in the midst of those who do not have an attitude of expectation. When I become a man of expectation, I'll stand out. Also, I can achieve, I want you to write this down in your heart if you don't have a notebook, I can achieve what I can conceive. Faith is when we achieve it in our minds. And it becomes reality. If I can conceive it, I am beginning to conceive an orphanage in Uganda with the Fort Payne Church of God heavily involved. I am beginning to conceive miracles taking place on this property and in this tri-state community where God receives all the yes, glory. Amen. Yes. I am conceiving literal physical miracles where the dead will be raised. Yes. If we can conceive it in our minds, then we can achieve it in reality. The truth is, in our minds, it's already a reality. I can achieve what I can conceive. Paul said, for I live in an eager expectation and of hope. The phrase eager expectation is only one word in the original Greek. And it is only used one other time in the New Testament, and that's in Romans 8 and 19. Where he said, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. The word literally means to look away from the head, to look forward towards something that you know is going to take place. It is living in an expectation. I want to stop right here and tell you that I'm expecting Jesus to come in and do it. Make no bones with that. I'm looking for Jesus to come any night or any day. I'm looking for Jesus to come and take his bride away. If he don't come tonight, I'm looking for him at daylight. I'm looking for Jesus to come. There is an expectation. But along with the expectation of his return must be an expectation of his manifestation. When you can conceive it, the reality of his return is real. But the reality of his manifestation is real. And God is looking for a people who will wake up in the mornings. Who will get up and before their feet touch the ground. Already acknowledge an expectation that God is going to do something miraculous today. Can you say amen? Amen. Yes. I want to go to slide eight. Malachi. When we live in expectation. We're not asking the Lord. Would you do this if you can? No, we're stating by the way we live our lives. Lord, we know that you can, and we know that you will. That's the way I've been praying this week. I'm praying different. I'm telling you, I'm praying different than, I, than I've been praying. I'm getting up in the night, and I'm doing some warfare. I'm telling you, we're going to bring down, we are bringing down strongholds. I hope you shut them in I mean, I'm telling you, the Lord, the Holy Ghost has got a hold of me, and He has been showing me how to pray. Been showing me what areas to pray. You ask the Lord to show you what your child is going through, what your friend, what your family is going through. He will show you how to pray. He'll show you where the stronghold is. He'll show you what floor he's on. He'll show you what room he's in. And he'll show you how to bring down that stronghold. Do you believe it? When you and I get up in the morning, there'll be a spirit of expectation. What are you expecting? Well, I'm expecting God to move. I'm expecting that phone call. Woo! Praise the 
I, I'm expecting the scenery to change. Yes. My God, I, Amen. I, I'm telling the Holy Ghost is all over me right now. I, I have an expectation that I haven't had in, in many years. The expectation I have concerning this church is different. It's not about buildings. It's not about numbers. It's not about any kind of program. It's not. No. It's about miracles taking place. Alcoholics being delivered. Drug addicts being delivered. It's about witnessing that breaks every protocol. It's about reaching into the hearts and lives and the homes of people in this community and watching God do something great. I've got a vision this week. I say a vision. The Lord put, a, put something in my spirit this week. This year, I want us to have contact with every house in Fort Payne, Alabama. I want us to knock on their door, introduce ourselves, and say to them, how can we pray for you? What would you have us praying about for your family? I believe that the harvest is white. I believe that people are ready and I believe this community is far closer to revival than they even realize. I'm expecting an outcome, but I'm telling you, it's not going to come without work. It's not going to come without an investment. It's not going to come without us getting more involved. A faith without works is dead. We've got to put work with these prayers. Amen. Amen. When we live in expectation. We can move forward with confidence. Anybody ever notice that churches get low on confidence? Pastors, Brother Rick, pastors get low on confidence. They don't feel like they can preach anymore. Well, I wonder where that came from. Amen? See, God has put something in each of us. Everybody is not a pastor. Why don't you listen closely? Everybody's not a pastor. Everybody's not an evangelist. Everybody's not an apostle, a prophet, or even a teacher or a pastor teacher. But everybody has a calling. One of the greatest mistakes that, and we heard some about this, I felt like uh, Sunday night, Pastor TJ was as anointed as I've ever heard him. If you missed it, you missed something. And he touched on some of this. One of the greatest mistakes we've ever made is we've let people preach when their calling wasn't necessarily that of an evangelist. We've let or allowed or encouraged or facilitated a calling. Sometimes people, the Bible says you have to make that calling sure. You have to tested and have to know. But every one of us have a calling. Yes. And my desire as a servant leader is that you can wake up in the morning with a spirit of expectation and say, God's going to use me today. Amen. God's going to open a door of opportunity. Let's go to number 10, Malachi. How do I begin to live a life of expectation? What I'm talking about right now is so far outside the realm of most people's way of thinking that we need to have some how-to instruction. Some of us are sitting here tonight and you say, Pastor, that sounds good, but I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you, I'm expecting. Well, it's more than just expecting His return. We need to have an expectation of His manifestation through the call of God that is in our lives. Some people have never even dealt with the fact that there's a call on their life. Brother Rick, a lot of people who are called and have access and have anointings and the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in them, they don't even know it. First time there's a word of prophecy comes to them, they're scared to death. They're intimidated. I remember praying for a woman 25 years ago. And 
an altar call as a pastor of the church. And a lady come forward and I was praying for her and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit showed me something very specific. And it was of great significance. If I had been wrong, it, it could have caused turmoil in that church. I questioned the Holy Spirit, which in my opinion, according to scripture, is a good thing. I do believe we are to try the Spirit. I didn't say, I didn't say grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit confirmed it in me and I spoke it and I spoke it out loud and it was, it was revealed, the family acknowledged it and I'm telling you God did a miraculous work and to God be the Lord. Yes. Yes. What if God wants to use you tomorrow? You're listening to me on social media. You're sitting here in this audience in this congregation tonight. A lot of folks, a lot of folks so busy watching politics that they're not being used to God. Now I'm not being mean, but I'm here to tell you a lot of folks are so consumed. I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot about people in the last year. I've learned a lot about preachers in the last year. You can learn a lot about preachers on Facebook. Amen. What I'm here to tell you is you need to get your eyes off of other people. You need to get your eyes off of other families. And you need to say, oh God, I want, I, I want and I expect you to use me. And that's where the real peace of God comes. And that's where real fulfillment comes. And that's when we grow in the Lord. How do I begin to live a life of expectation? Number 11 says this, Malachi. Number one, we live for Christ and not ourselves. I'm, I am so dependent on the Holy Spirit to do the work right now because there's so much preaching in this state that in, a, in two hours of loud declaration, I could never convince anyone of what the Holy Spirit needs to convince someone about this tonight. But you hear this preacher, it's not about you. Amen. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a promise. Yes, yes. And to be lifted up by Him, you must humble yourself yes, yes. before Him. I'm not talking tonight about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about humbling yourself to a point and you realize that you're nothing and that we are broken vessels touched by the grace and the mercy of God. But I have an expectation that God is going to take this vessel. I have struggled in my spirit all day with this. I have not had a day in many years like I have today in that I do not feel like a preacher. But I'm here to tell you that when you and I come to the realization that we are nothing without Him, yeah, yeah. that it is not about us, it is not about our abilities, it's not about our talents, it's not about our calling even, it's not about what we do good or God has blessed me with this ability. It's not about our charisma. Right. It is an expectation that in spite of all of my stuff, God's going to use me. In spite of all that we are and all that we do, I have this expectation that God's going to take some nobodies and do some miraculous things. I want you to join me in doing something. I want you to check yourself and in the days to come, I want you to join me in never being guilty of 
calling this Ron Johnson's church. Too many times we hear people talk about so-and-so's church. So-and-so's church. Pastor, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There is definitely something wrong with it. For he is the head of the church. He owns the church. It is not our church. We are his body. And it's all about him. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's all about him. I live in eager expectation. And hope that I will never do anything that causes me shame. But that I will always be bold for Christ. Paul eagerly expects and hopes for three things that we need to pledge ourselves. Number 13, I'm having to help Malachi, you always be patient. Number one, he said, I live in eager expectation and hope. Number one, that I will never do anything that will cause shame. That I would never do anything that would cause reproach. Upon the name of Jesus. Let me just, I'll try not to take too, too much of a side, side trail. For the last 60 years, I, I believe that it's very possibly to be exact 58. I, I think it's very possible that when they took prayer out of school that it began something very specific. But if you look back the last six decades, you will see a sexual revolution and an antichrist spirit that has taken our society to new depths and levels. And I'm just here to tell you you and I better get our eyes on Jesus and get our eyes off of this world and come out from among them and be separate. Present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. We now have a president who has made appointments today for transgenders to be in leadership of this nation. God forbid. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to preach more and more holiness. If you don't like it, you can, look, there's the door or here's an altar. Right. Make your choice. I'd rather you choose an altar. Amen. We're going to pray for this leadership. We're going to pray for this every leadership. But I'll tell you what I'm praying and expecting. I'm expecting and praying for God to remove the sin and remove the evil and to bring down everything that brings shame to the name of Jesus Christ. i got a lot more to say and I'm going to finish up these three points. But I want to tell you, I don't think COVID is over. If you're, if, you're, if you're waiting on a vaccine to take everything back to normal, you're sadly mistaken. You're sadly mistaken. I'm not here to argue with anyone about God creating or God instigating, but I will tell you that God has used this worldwide pandemic to get people to turn to God and very few have. I do believe that much of the church is more people praying than ever. If you do the math and you got the church and you got, I do believe that a lot of people are praying. But as I watched the inauguration today, I heard one statement at the end by that precious gentleman praying. One statement about repentance of sin. It was his statement and most everybody else had their eyes open and they were just wanting to get over it. This nation hasn't turned to God. 
This nation hasn't humbled themselves. In fact, much of the church hasn't changed their positions. In fact, most of the church has changed their position. They're more backslid than they were a year ago. Staying out of church and never planning to go back. Asleep because of blindness and because of pride. We live in a world. Listen, I'm looking for Jesus to come. I have an expectation. And I believe what I believe we need to wake up every morning and say, if I can live with expectation, I can, I can live a life that does not bring shame to my Lord and Savior. I want to tell somebody just as simple as it can be said tonight. Get up in the morning and live right. Don't tell me you don't know how. Everybody in this building knows how. And if there's areas where you don't know, you can talk to the Holy Ghost. He'll help you and lead you and guide you and all truth. You start to do something, the Holy Ghost say, no, that means not. Amen? It's amazing how much peace some people have had if they just live right. Yes, sir. People say, well, I just can't know you can help me. Give me just a minute. Hey, I've got to bear down on this just a little bit. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to watch the junk. You don't have to speak vile, filth. There's nothing saying that you have to partake in the in the sexual uh, the sexual activity that is going on in the world. It is unbelievable what people are talking about and what people if, if we're talking about all of this, what's going on in the mind? Get up in the morning and live right. Quit criticizing those that live right and try it. You might like it. Try it. Quit criticizing those that are good. I feel like I'm talking to somebody tonight. When I tell you, quit talking about those and speaking evil of their good. I've heard a lot this morning about a more perfect union. I, I too would love to see a more perfect union. God's called us to a more perfect life. We need to get up every morning with the expectation that by the help and strength of God, I'm going to live right. I'm going to have peace. I'm not going to let anger control my mind. If you don't, if you're not careful, that anger will sneak up on you. You know, the enemy had you hating somebody before you even realize what's going on. Yes, sir. Rage. How many of you think that over the last couple of weeks, rage has caused some problems for some people? <coughs> See, rage will cause you to cross boundaries, do and say things you shouldn't do. When you have a spirit of expectation, our life will always honor Christ. The power of expectation doesn't revolve around what I'm going to get, but on what I'm going to give. If you want to live with the power of expectation, I'm just going to finish with this. We need to live with an effort to improve the lives of others. Oh, God help us in the last 15 years, the last 60 years, some of the garbage that has been preached in the name of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't, I, I love you, but I don't even care if you don't agree with me. It's still the truth. Some people, some people got an expect, oh God, I'm expecting big money today. Money come, money come. I've heard it. I'm not calling names and I'm not being overly 
through. But when I'm talking about expecting God to do something for me tomorrow, I'm talking about God using me. Amen. How many of you want God to use you tomorrow? The gifts to operate. How many of you want to raise the dead one day? Well, I'm going to tell you, you've got to be faithful in the small things to be used in the large things. Stand up if you will. This is a small Wednesday night congregation, 30, 40 people. I don't know how many is here. But I'll tell you this. If we would all have great expectation tomorrow, I wonder what 30 people could do in the kingdom tomorrow. 